All right, this is a, you might have seen a test that I've put down there, had your, I was asking for your dog's name and all that stuff. And, uh, that's a test, that's a test we're going to need to uh, go through when all this is over with. But whatever, what I want to talk about on today is weak links, all right? I'm going to go ahead and start my slideshow from the beginning. There's not right out of that part. Weak links. A weak link is if you, uh, how many of you guys have ever worked on a vehicle and you kind of know what usually fails on that vehicle and so that's where you look first, right? Whenever uh, she came in here, when you get to doing work, where you're doing a lot of work, you'll run into this. But uh, whenever uh, the Sonia came in here with her car, she was talking about it, was telling her that the uh, um, cut off the engine because you got no oil pressure. Of course, it wasn't making any noise, it wasn't that low at all. And so she was concerned about that. And basically what I did was I went to Identifix, pulled up that car, and it basically showed you that uh, there were eight instances of this happening, and every single one of them was the oil pressure sending unit. We are going to take the oil pressure sending unit off, and the, uh, it's not pipe thread on that one. It's like 14 millimeter, one and a half thread pitch with an O-ring. Uh, so it's really irritating to try to come up with a fitting so you can hook a master gauge up to it unless you've got a kit that's got one of those fittings in it. One way or another, we pull that thing off, and... You can see down in the terminals where it was leaking. That was a weak link on that chain. It really helps to be able to go to your technical service bulletin, your identifix, your IETN, or whatever, get the weak link for the chain. Uh, uh, Kia engines basically like to burn at least one valve about 100,000 miles. If they jump time, if a Kia engine jumps time, it beats the crud out of the piston, the cylinder head, and everything because it snaps heads off valves. And uh, basically, we're going to look at all this. Now, there was a uh, this little uh, Chrysler. K cars that we used to work on whenever I was, we were doing work for a phone company and they were having problems whenever the AC would kick on they would almost die they had a little carburetor on them this was like mid 80s model cars with a little 2.2 engine and we fought with those dadgum things and finally uh, figured out that the base of the carburetor was warped but you couldn't see it and so I took the carburetor off blew the gas out and I'd start flat filing it and i see the shiny come together and when I flat filed it made it flat again put it back on it fix those cars and we fought with them for several years trying to set up the phone company people. Well, this particular truck that we're talking about here came in with a really bad coolant leak. And I'm talking about, he says, I might, it must be coming from under the head. So he's pouring coolant in it and it's pouring out at the front left corner of the engine like water coming out of a bucket. I mean, as fast as you pour it in, it would run out just as fast. And so he gets it over there. And so we pull the intake manifold off because that's where it was coming from and we found this which is very common see this all the time all these gaskets that are plastic and silicone made together and everybody that uses those under an intake manifold has that kind of problem sooner or later there was an f-150 that came in here that he had taken it to a shop over there it was a 97 model and it had a little v6 in it and he took it over there and he said it was water just raining from everywhere under the truck and the shop he took it to said it needed all the freeze plugs and it was going to cost a thousand dollars before they did anything else they had to put all the freeze plugs in it and so he brought it over here and we found one freeze plug leaking which may have been what they seen but what was actually happened we had a situation like that and the intake manifold had given away and it was just pouring water out and it was just raining down everywhere it's really difficult sometimes to find it it's raining all over the place but that's what the deal was on that um, but one way or another, uh, we had to move the AC compressor and bracket and all that kind of stuff to do that. Well, uh, there was a listener, uh, Montana, that came to us one time. Well, actually, I was going to show you this too. Putting the thing back on, you see the remember if you recognize these fuel lines, you see these fuel lines on the GM? Well, whenever the person that was putting this back together was screwing these lines back in, he basically, what he did was he got that line started. And instead of making sure it was started right, he just cranked it in there with the wrench and he, he botched the threads up over here on that fitting. And we had to do a bunch of work on that fitting there to get it to where it would screw in there and seal. So that was a bunch of extra work that got made on there. What did you do to this file? We, we, we used a thread file on it, so we did. Uh, this right here was a, a corroded connector that was on a, if anybody is familiar with some of the uh, two, you know, turn of the century GM cars will recognize that connector. And basically they had uh, this Montana that came out there and they said it wouldn't start, fuel pump relay was kicking on, but there was no ground coming from the fuel pump up to the relay. I hook a test light up to the hot, touched it to the socket going back, 
kicked the gas tank, the light came on, that leads us to think we may have a fuel pump issue. Turned out this connector, which is right in front of the left rear wheel, was feeding the fuel pump, and see all that corrosion there? That connector was what the problem was. We had to get all that. Seems to me like I got pigtails and we replaced the entire connector. Now those pigtails are kind of pricey, but in a situation like that, they had this thing, it's supposed to be a weather pack connector that keeps the moisture out, but it had basically got enough salt splash up in there to where it screwed that connector up. That was a weak link. If on that particular vehicle, I imagine there's probably been several of those. That's the only one we ever saw, but that was pretty nasty. This right here is what happened. And I got an email about one similar to this right after we ran into this one here. See how it snapped the head off that valve and it just beat everything up and destroyed the piston and scored the cylinder walls and beat the head up and all that. This guy sent me an email that his wife and him were driving to Florida from North Carolina when a 2004 Kia Rio broke down, timing belt broke, and the entire engine had to be replaced. They still owed $7,000 on the car. They said, would you advise seeking another, sinking another 3,000 into the Kia with 90,000 miles? Could it have been avoided? They were supposed to have already replaced the timing belt, but they ignored the timing belt change interval and it blew up in their faces. That's what happens when you ignore the timing. It's best for you to choose when the timing belt gets replaced instead of letting the timing belt choose when the timing belt gets replaced. Right. That's one of those Same things. Same huh? Same one of those Ford uh, four belt sixes. Uh -huh. that somebody, I guess they overread it, overrevved it, and you know they got a rev limiter on them and floated the valves all in one cylinder. Yeah. Yeah, they overrevved it. What do you mean by floating the valves? Explain that. Like the, valves got to move so fast the piston collided with it. Yeah, the valves couldn't close fast enough not to hit the piston. You ever seen that in a race car? Happens all the time, don't it? Uh, that's floating the valve. And, uh, I mean, and that's when you're attacking it out uh, too high. But anyway, uh, well, the, the maintenance men were driving that 2001 Chevrolet pickup that we got out there now uh, that we got sitting out there on our land. Uh, there was these little 4.3 liter CSFI fuel systems. They drive around the campus doing their work and at least twice a day they were experiencing this hot soak no start that would require about 20 minutes of cool down time and then the truck would start to run normally. That was tricky, wasn't it? All right, so, well, it was right outside my department one day and I hooked it up and I found out that it had fuel pressure but it didn't have any injector pulse. And then I plugged the scan tool in and found out that the vehicle theft deterrent system had it timed out. Only Chevy's if that, uh, BT, you know, vehicle theft system with the key goes south, then you, you can wait about 20 minutes and it'll crank up and go on. It keeps you from being totally broken down. Talking and you about got a little parts truck to come out here? Uh, no, not the parts truck, the one that, the, the white Chevrolet that we got sitting out here that, you know, that Gene used to drive. Remember we had that parts truck come Yeah, out that here. was a different time. one. That was the same situation on that one. They had to wait 20 minutes for it to go and it was, uh, it was funny. They usually have to replace the uh, ignition switch to make that problem go away and all that. But, but anyway, there's a technical service bullet that GM has that says you should, the injector poppets, which are those funky spider poppets under the dead gum manifold, you're supposed to uh, run the fuel pressure up to 150 pounds with a special tool and operate them with a Tech 2 to try to clean those poppets out, which is kind of a crazy thing. Uh, but anyway, uh, this guy, the, uh, the parts manager over there at the uh, Chevrolet place says, well, try a cap and rotor because sometimes the AC suction line will drip on the, uh, I'm going to tell you about the ignition switch there in a minute, will drip on the uh, distributor and cause that kind of stuff. Now, this right here, and this is, a, this is a digression from talking about the Chevrolet, this is a forward ignition switch like they used for years on the pickup trucks. Uh, see how that thing's coming apart? Uh, there was a recall on those things like the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and we had to put uh, ignition switches on there on every one of those doggone things because those ignition switches coming apart could cause them to catch fire. And one time on the front end lift, I saw one catch fire because of that ignition switch. He had it up on the lift, he was in there getting parts, and when he came out there was a fire that was burning up the dash and it cracked the windshield already and all, and it started right there at the ignition switch. And basically some stuff got together in there and it just got really hot. So basically that ignition switch was a weak link that they found. That's what a technical service bulletin is about. They find a bunch of stuff failing the same way. They basically put out a bulletin uh, and you look at that. Now here's a, here's a weak link on the 90s model Camry, 2.2 wall pump O-ring failure. Whenever you put dye in one of those Camrys and you see that uh, leak coming from around that oil pump, don't be surprised. Uh, it'll look like 
it's coming from the pan. But that's not what it is typically. It's going to be this little O-ring that goes behind this fuel pump. I mean, this oil pump cover, I'm sorry. It's going to make it leak like that. That's what we found on one of those. That was the car that was uh, leaking oil. And, uh, another place the camera likes to leak is from the camshaft seal, and it'll run down behind the timing belt and the timing cover and drip on the ground on the same side of the engine. So they're kind of prone to oil leaks on this side of the engine. My son's got one, a 98 Camry uh, that uh, there was a shop up there that put a pan gasket on it, charging about $400, and then he lost about a quarter of oil every 100 miles when they got here, and we put a few, an oil pump over it on it. And I think they gave him the money back after I sent him a picture of it. Uh, but anyway, I put a distributor cap and a rotor on that Chevrolet just because. It didn't run hard to do, popped it on there, and he had no more trouble for a long time, like for weeks and weeks and weeks, he didn't have any more trouble. I'm thinking, well, maybe I fixed it. Well, the next time the problem happened, it turned out to be the, that silly, you know, any theft thing. Uh, all right, so we got the Chevrolet put back together. I talked about this one a little bit the other day, uh, this same one. Uh, but I'm going to tell you about another weak link right now that I almost forgot about. Uh, this car right here, like a uh, 93 model, uh, old mobile, and it came in here just pouring water out from behind the alternator, and this is what we found. That plastic fitting right there, why in the world they want to run water through plastic like that? I never have understood it. It's basically hot water like that. And that thing gave way. And that's what it looked like right there when we got it out of there. It was busted. So what we did is we got this steel one that was made for that repair, uh, and it was made in China, but it was steel. So that's not going to fail again. It's going to be better than it was. See? Have a steel replacement. Every one of these was a weak link. Every one of them was a design flaw, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so it was a lot better quality than that. Now, what's wrong with this picture? Somebody tell me what's wrong with that picture. Anybody know? That's on backwards. Lug nuts are on backwards. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people put this that gum lug nuts on backwards around here. And I had to catch that. I walked over here and looked at it, and I said, what is them lug nuts doing on backwards? And you pull them off the other way, you know. Sometimes when I have a little expo with students come over here, and I'll tell them pull a tire off, put it back on the impact race, and they'll try to put it back on backwards like that, because they think that dome side should go out. I don't understand what I know about that. All right. This right here is another one that was on about on late 90s, early 2000s Chevys. You got these, uh, I'm in here, but uh, they got these, uh, fingers that slide across that uh, fuel gauge. See how they're worn out there on that side? And the new ones are a slightly different design. I don't know how many of those we've had to replace right here. That's how they, those things fail. Now, what we had to do on that particular truck when we got through putting the manifold back on it, putting the new manifold gasket back on it, we had no mass airflow. I talked about, I talked about this a little bit the other day. Now you see how I built this little thing right here? You basically got a, a circuit breaker. It's like eight, maybe ten amps at the most, you know. And we're gonna basically gonna hook two wires to it. They're gonna hook up to either side of our fuse. And on either side, on the other side of this, we're coming off of it with a light bulb. So when this short is in place and that circuit breaker opens up, that light bulb is gonna light. Because basically it's gonna be your shorted part of the ground and the power is gonna be like that. The breaker's going to try to close. It's going to close and open, close and open, close and open. And that's a good thing. You need to use one that doesn't have many amps so it'll burn something up. This is a little short finder trick that I got. Okay, whenever you look at your schematic and you see the mass airflow is fed by engine one fuse, 15, which is a 20 amp, right? Okay, so here you've got to, uh, you can come in here. So basically that 20 amp fuse is feeding all of this stuff right here. And it looks like, well, it's feeding the stuff right here, but you also got to recognize that it's, there's, it's going other places that you don't know about, right? All right, so you keep looking. And here we got that same splice, you see that? We got the same fuse, it doesn't say 15, but it's the same fuse because you can tell these two terminals are the same ones, engine one fuse. And look where it goes. It goes to all four of these oxygen sensors. Okay, so while this breaker's tripping off and on and we got it in there, what we're doing is we're unplugging everything one at a time that's fed by those. And when we unplug that oxygen sensor right there, the breaker stopped tripping. We had a shorted oxygen sensor, an internal short on the oxygen sensor, and it was causing it to blow that fuse, which that fuse also fed the mass airflow. So that's why we didn't have a mass airflow. We had a shorted oxygen sensor heater, which didn't set a code. 
So basically, when you put a when you find out the mass airflow don't have any power going to it, and you put a fuse in there, it goes pop. You need to be thinking there's something down there that shorted out. Didn't have any rat chew wires. We didn't have anything that was uh, rubbing against ground. We basically had a shorted sensor. Uh, and there you, there's, there's your CFSI distribu CSFI distributor uh, suction hose. And it's going to get the distributors down here. And it likes to sweat and drip water on the distributor. That's a sort of a weak link in that chain. Uh, and so anyway, we got that other took care of. Now, as I look at this, I remember another one that was uh, we were fighting with. You see that little carbon button right there? Uh, that's an important piece. There's a girl come in here with a, uh, uh, she had actually worked at docks and she came in here, she, had a, she was a dog trainer and her name was Katie. And she had a little blue uh, blazer and it was making radio noise. You know, you're hearing all that radio, you hear something like that before you drive you up the wall. But I said, all right, I want to listen to this radio noise with it turned up really high. And when I unplugged the ignition coil, it immediately stopped. Okay, so I found out it wasn't the alternator by unplugging the alternator and doing it. And this little carbon button had fell out of there and was rolling around down in here. And so the fire that was coming out of the coil was having to jump about that far. And anywhere you got a naked spark, you got radio frequency interference, you're going to have radios going to pick it up. You know what I'm saying? So we put a, basically put a distributor cap on her and got rid of the radio. Now, here's your camera target adjustment uh, that you got to have here. One of the things that I thought was very interesting was your cam retard, that's where you turn the distributor until you get that to zero, because that's usually what most of them call for. It's hard to find this in the shop manual. Whenever they gave us the latest update on the one scan tool we got in here, they took cam retard offset away from us, so you couldn't even see it anymore. But it's a necessary adjustment because you're setting rotor alignment. That engine's got a crank sensor, turn the distributor doesn't change the timing, it just changes rotor alignment and cam, which the cam sensor is in there. Uh, but that camera chart I'll say is really important. That one scan tool we got in the gray box in there, it will give you that, but the other scan tool we got will not. Why they took it away, I don't know. Um, owner error. This guy right here wired up his big Bronco like it was a 1542637A, and it should have been 1372654A. It ran really bad. It acted like I had a blown head gasket. He actually gave us the vehicle as a trainer vehicle, and then I found out whenever I put the spark plug wires on it right, all of that went away. All the acting like it was in the room. My buddy bought a little Nissan truck for like 100 bucks. Oh, same thing happened. Yeah. yeah you can get it messed up like that. But he, he used the fire order that they had on some of the I mean, on the older ones. They changed them all to 1372 On a 5.8, it was that. On 302, it was the same as the other. And this is what happens when you spill toner on your desk. See that? Drop the toner cartridge. Poof. Toner all over the desk. All over my papers and everything. No. So what, what would you do about that? Would you have to replace all the papers and everything? No, just vacuum it up. Exactly. That toner doesn't stick to anything unless it's hot. Unless it's hot. So I busted out the vacuum cleaner, and when I was through, you could never tell it was there. But when it happened, I was like, oh, no. You ever, you ever had that feeling? You ever had a little feeling? All right. Okay, that's the end of the slide show. All right, now there is a... Our little test here. Let's talk about our little. Huh? What? I gotta turn these papers in real quick. Your papers, what? I gotta turn them in. Yeah, turn them in. Hurry up. We gotta, we gotta zip through these questions and we'll be through. Okay, an engine's been removed from a high mileage rear wheel drive vehicle and resealed for serial, several serious oil leaks. After the engine's reinstalled and started, the transmission fluid leak appears from the bell housing area. Technician A says the front pump torque converter seal was probably damaged but during the repair. Technician B says the PCV system needs to be checked since it may have caused the engine oil leaks. You're right about that. Both. Both of those guys are right. Customer complains that her gas pedal sticks at the top of the travel and pops loose as she continues to apply foot pressure to the pedal. This problem is probably due to what? What do you think? Anybody ever seen a dirty throttle body around here lately? You put one of those? Uh, PO401 code will probably be through due to clogged EGR passages. If it's not flowing EGR, can be a DPFE sensor. Clogged EGR passages are more common, particularly if it's an old vehicle. A misfiring spark plug will cause the O2 sensor to indicate what kind of exhaust. Better get a good answer here. What do you think? We talked about this the other day. What's it going? What would you think? 
Rich. It's going to show lean because it's not using the air when it's not firing, right? You'd think rich, but the oxygen sensor don't smell gas, right? An air leak between the mass airflow sensor and the throttle body will cause what? Hello? Wow. Which way is it going to correct? Fuel exactly. Which way they're going to go? Positive. Positive, because it's got unmetered air, right? We just talking about that. After undergoing major work in a body shop, a no start condition is being investigated. The PCM won't communicate with the scan tool. There's no ref I mean, and there's no reference voltage to any sensor. Technician A says the body shop may have damaged the PCM while welding body panels. Technician B says power and ground of the PCM should be checked. Both those guys are right. I've actually seen people uh, in body shops destroy engine controllers. I'm putting the ground over here and welding over there and it burns up the engine. They say, well, I'll nuke the battery. What? Do you have this on the generator? I'll probably have this one. I got this you one. You can pressure on it. I got this one too. Okay. Alright. Engine is being investigated for overheating problem. The engine started after a six hour cold soak. Allowed to run for 60 seconds. A hissing sound of escaping pressure is heard when the radiator cap is removed. What do you think that's going to be? Oh, blown head, head gasket. That's a good man there. Loose fuel filler cap will generally set what code? You remember uh, Jessica's truck? What code was she having? Do I don't remember? remember what it was. PO455? All right. That's what it was, PO455. Variable cam timing is commonly used for what? A couple of things nowadays. Power. Knox control. You close the intake exhaust valves early, leave some exhaust gas in there, you don't have as much knocks. Retarded cam timing can cause what? Can it cause low engine vacuum? Can it cause rich air fuel mixture? Can it cause late hard transmission shift? All of the above. What was nine? Nine? Knox control. Everything I told you guys about is stuff that I have seen. So now consider yourself having seen it too. And that finishes the